A question came up on my YouTube channel asking me on how I use my MIDI mappings on the MIDI controller. And that was a good question because I was in that same process. I tried to just close the gap between what I see a lot of guys on Ableton do and I want to see if I can do that with the MPC Live and a Launch Control XL. So I was really digging deep into how I can actually get closer to what Stefan Botsin does with his Livid controller or what Anto does with Ableton. So this is how you use a MIDI controller. I guess that's today's video. Let's go do it right now. Hey, what's up and welcome. I'm Analog Kitchen and thank you for checking out yet another video. Now, if this is your first time here, don't hesitate to click subscribe, hit that bell. You'll be updated whenever I upload a new video, which is weekly on Friday nights. You will be kept in the loop. You won't miss out on anything. We're building a community and it's actually pretty cool. So come and check it out. Hang out to the end of the video. I'll tell you who my new patrons are. It's really amazing. I'll tell you about Discord. I'll tell you about the Patreon. I'll tell you about the Mixer. I'll tell you about a lot of stuff. Hang out to the end of the video. Stay tuned. So you hear me talk about this thing of a difference between what a lot of people with Ableton do or what DJs are doing effect-wise and what you can do with your own dollar setup. There is a bit of a gap because obviously hmm, just using synthesizers and drum machines is a concept that's been around for a long time. I mean, listen to any music out of 1983 and you know exactly what it is. So if you want to sound a little bit more modern, there's a few things that you need to do in order to get to that modern kind of uh, current sound, right? I mean, we all love Deepesh Mode, we all love I Just Can't Get Enough, but listen to that track and you know exactly what sequenced uh, synthesizers and drum machines are all about. And the sound of today, especially in the melodic techno realm, is a little bit more enhanced where there's a lot of like trickery dickery duck going on at the minute. So I've looked, it was ADE recently, so I looked at Anto's set very closely and I looked at uh, Stefan Botsin who played Mark Martina just a few weeks ago and I was like hmm how can I maybe get my mapping to not do the, the exact same thing but to just at least have control over filters drum rolls over um, reverb over cutoffs and do that on the fly in a way that doesn't really affect my um, quickness on transitioning which is going to be another video. I know you guys have asked for it. So transitioning, that's going to be another video. But today I just wanted to look into the aspect of the MIDI mapping. This is how you use a MIDI controller in the way that Stefan Botsin does it and that Ento's doing it. Now, right, I do understand it might come across as a bit clickbaity, but I do also think that there's a lot of people that are going to benefit from this video because we all struggle with it. You know, it's cool to make a cool pattern. It's cool to just make like um, uh, a cool sort of like loop, but to get out of the loop and get going and get from one point to another is actually a different thing. So I thought to get into that. So today I'm actually mapping out a few mappings that I see a lot of those uh, cats do when they come up with Ableton and let's see if we can bring it to the dollars game as well. You ready? We're gonna head over to the live set and let's make that work, shall we? Hey, welcome to the live set. Welcome to the top view of my uh, setup. You can see on the far side, I've got a cathedral, which I tried to make work with the subsequent 37. And for some reason, I wasn't too happy with the results I got from it. So it's all a work in progress. If you follow this channel, you know exactly what it is. So the Electron of the Track and the Akai MPC Live, those are my go-to machines. I've got the Minotaur sitting with the Sub 37. People were coming up and saying like, if you've got the Sub 37, wouldn't it be a little bit redundant to think that the Minotaur is going to add something to it? This machine is a beast, guys. If you don't check out this machine, it's really amazing. But unfortunately, the stuff that you can do with it is not limited to what you see right here. You need to take it to the computer, hook it up and just get the editor. And there's a page that says under the hood. And then there's an extended page where there's so many different things that you can do with the two oscillators. So it's an amazing machine. I have utilized today um, the Akai MPC Live over on this side um, and the Launch Control XL over on this side. Now, um, what I wanted to do was get a little bit closer to those Ableton cats, namely um, 
uh, Stefan Botsen because he has mapped something away on his um, uh, livid driven uh, plexiglass uh, uh, custom made MIDI controller which is absolutely amazing but at the same time not undoable if he knows if you know what he is aiming for now I have got a track that sounds like this there's a few things that are happening as you can see what I have done though is um, I've got my drums laid out on different tracks so this if I go to the next sequence page you can see that I spaced out my tracks this is one track this is one track for some reason out of four different sort of like um, uh, sequences and this the top row is also a track so instead of having two tracks consisting of eight sequences I have now opted to go with different I don't know it just worked out that way so um, it's cool because this track is some sort of a transitioning track so rather than having a transition pattern I have a transition track which is completely different doing something else um, the sound that I have got here is uh, this as I played there's a few things happening now what I see Stefan Botsen do is he's got access to his kick where he can um, either mute it temporarily or mute it indefinitely. So that's what I've done. So let's start with the kick right now. So if I'm playing it, on my first track you can see I've mapped away volume on, volume on the kick. That's what I've mapped away. So if it's playing, there's a few things that you would want to have, ha have happen. Um, Snare rolls is another thing that you want to have happen. So I've got a snare roll on the second track. I don't have the fader mapped to it. I've only mapped it to the to the bottom control. So it's already playing and this demutes it. So on the Akai, when you go to the MIDI control page, you can see I flipped the channel. So it's pattern 88. That's over here. We'll go to the uh, sample page, which is, let's go to my, um, where it's playing, it's here on the X. You can see that it's constantly lighting up. I don't know if you can make it out on the jet. This pattern A8 is constantly lighting up. Now, if I'm hitting this uh, second bottom row on my launch control XL, it's going to demute this this uh, pad, as you can hear. Now, what I've also done, if I go in, so say I'll go into the program edit, I'll go to pad A8, then you'll see and with the envelope here, that I've mapped the envelope, here, as you can see. So the envelope is also doing something. So say I'm gonna take out my kick. I can do it like this. Well, I can also demute it, which is here. So now it's gone. So I don't have, I've got my hands free to do something else, right? Okay. So, um, you can hear that the, the snare is playing. Look at the screen on the NPC and look what I'm doing over here. Demute kick, bam. And there you go, so instant, instant um, satisfaction. So I will also go in. The thing is I don't go close all the way because then you, you, hear, you don't really hear it. So the snare's also mapped. So the snare's mapped and the kick is mapped. Now obviously, I've done the reverse thing with the kick. Now if I wanted to uh, take out the kick, I'll just press this and leave it like that. So this, you only need two fingers now to wield the drum roll and mute the kick at the same time, as you can see. One, two, three, goes back and, ah, there you go. It's simple, simple concept, but it works. What else have I muted? Um, there is an arpeggio that's playing something that I've muted on track three. So there's a bit of melody that plays. So if I'm hitting this, it will demute and it will mute the kick here. Again, drum roll, go in. Kick in. So you hear that stuff is really moving and migrating. I almost go back to this spot right here. Now, this is something that's cool. What I see Stefan Botsen also do is he's, he can actually um, manipulate his claps. He's got a lot of 808 claps that he's playing on a separate track. And he's mapped delay and reverb to it. What I have done is I've mapped my claps to a submix, and on that submix, which is over here, so if you go in and you go to uh, the mixer page, see if I can put it up quick fast, then I've got a submix 
I wonder if we can make it out. Well, not here. There is a submix that I have routed away. This is a, those are my um, uh, normal channels. On the submix page, I've set a few different things. So now the claps that are playing. Bat, 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 bat. Let's uh, turn this off. Listen to this. Again. So you can go in and, and, and manipul manipulate your drums that way. Now that's a cool a cool thing to use. Um, again, I have a delay that keeps uh, hanging, so that that manipulation of the sound that's playing right here, which is a sound that um, um it's a single waveform actually that I got from Vinyl. I think it's the let's see, yeah, it's a Jupiter Eight. There's a high pluck. I've also done a little bit of sound design on it so if I go in program edit you'll see that obviously there's a lot of tweaking that's been going on if I'm going out of this program go here go to this page you can see whoa I've got an air filter which is there I see it so there's a filter over here that I don't think that I've mapped And the reason that I've done it is because I can tweak it in a different fashion. Now, what I would have liked on the Akai mapping is that you could set, like, maybe, like, on the Massive, you could set, like, a space within, um, say, maybe between here, 1.7, 1.8 kilohertz, and maybe 12K, that the filter would only work in there because also, going out, I've got a delay on the second slot. Looking at the delay, that's there. I didn't map it out. Um, and the feedback is on 51%, the mix is on 65%, so it hangs. So if I mute it, I can play around. Mute the kick. And the length of the snare is a cool thing because sometimes you want the snare to be subtle, sometimes you want your snare to be loud. You don't want to map out two snares on different levels. What you can do is just like work with the release. I listen to the arpeggio. Everything is very audible, very clear to hear. And then when I take it out, obviously it will hang out. So it will wash out. You can do this in length. And then there's another thing that I've added to this arpeggio, which is over here, and that's a resampler. Obviously, I put a little bit of bit crush on there, so it's decimating on round three. Uh, the rate is 45, and the dry wet is on 100%, so it's completely uh, altering the sound. Because with single waveforms, you can actually have your Akai act as a synthesizer, if you will. So that's what I'm doing. Um, the fact that I'm using it is because if you know the Akai, it takes a lot a lot of um, of uh, memory if you're using uh, big reverbs and splash and things so you want your sound to be very small that's how I've used it now now okay um, moving on there's something else that I have mapped which is cool um, and that is the XY effect the XY pretty much means that if I'm holding it my screen It'll be cool to just map that out. Now, the thing is, you have to think on routing uh, if you are using it this way, because um, the whole mix will now be taken out of the equation, which means that I've got my um, uh, my X-pad routed in a momentary fashion, so I'm playing like this. I'm pressing this button here, so I've mapped the one of those buttons on the side, the mute button usually on the launch control XL, I've mapped it to holding it. And then those two knobs above my kick, because I want to do everything muscle memory wise fast. So say, mute the kick, go in. Da -da -da. So you can hear that that's completely crazy. The problem with this is though, I don't know where I am in the beat. So this is where the Octatrack comes in, uh, because the Octatrack is a layer of 
control that goes over the Akai MPC Live. So the stereo output of my Akai MPC Live goes into the octave track, as does the mini tower, as does the sub sequence. But that means that now I've got full control over everything, over all the sounds. But the fun part is that on channel eight, which is the master output, you can hear that if I'm going to, so track seven is the uh, Akai, track six, is the subsequent track five is the mini tower or vice versa anyway so those channels are already allocated let's play a sample yeah so you see that i've got like something to go over the beats i've got some samples backed up so that if for some reason this and this doesn't play i can always have a backup of something play the kick two three and that's just a sample coming out of my sample and hold sound pack. Um, I'll put a link on screen where you can get those samples or if something else maybe. Something that just keeps going so you got like some sort of a hypnotizing thing happening. There's another sound that I have. I think this works well with the beat. It's a bit on the loud side, let's go in. Say so that's on track true. Let's go into the amp page and turn it down a little bit. There's an LFO that's happening on there. Pick out the kick. Sometimes I like to just wheel the, 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 the kick like this. I can, I can bring it in slowly. You know? So you can build tension that way. Just can take it out momentarily and go in. So sometimes if I'm too late to just wheel the fader or mute it uh, like that because that can be a tad irresponsive. I have to say the launch control uh, Excel can be a little bit uh, irresponsive. Uh, I don't know if it's the launch control or whether it's the uh, Akai. Anyway, a fader will always work and a momentary thing will always work. So let's add a little bit more flavor to this. Snare. One, two, three, go in. Nice, now this is already working, yeah? So I'm liking that. So now I've got like all these effects that I keep hearing on those records and I've got it to work. But there's another thing that if I've got my beat jittering going on here, there's not much that I can do. See, nothing happens now. It's all stuck because I stuck the beat. So what you would want is something to have control over this. I was telling you that if I'm using the timing on the beat repeats, I'm not sure where I am in the beat. So I'm using this in an effect, but listen, the crossfader here is mapped to the master of the octave track. And then on my scenes, it's, I've got my uh, fourth scene B, which is on uh, uh, tricks 12. What I've done here is that if I open it up, it's only going to be cut off on the complete sound, which means that sometimes I'm late, I just mask this, take it out, take it out, take it out, and go back in, bam. So you can go completely crazy, just a bit of a little bit of a techno fashion. Also, if I'm going back in, I'll put another snare here, so that I can always override what's happening over here, so I've got an extra layer of control. And then, go in. There's a lot of stuff that you can do with the crossfader, mind you. I've now mapped it to just be cut off, or what I have here is this. Also, on my first trick, it's the same thing, but now the cutoff will happen with reverb. Snare. Go back out. Now, can you see that if you map your uh, pattern out, how much control you have over the pattern now? So you have to just like memorize and be very cautious of where you stick stuff. That's more stuff that I've got mapped out obviously. If I will go to a different track, let's do that for instance. Let's go out, see, go to my sequence page. First of the beat. Completely different track. 
Now you can hear that there's a different thing happening at the moment. Another arpeggio. It's also the Jupiter sound that I've worked a little differently. Now, There's a lot of stuff that is happening at the minute and it's interesting so I've built up my tracks in a way that um, a lot of stuff will be happening on my drums because I'm making dance music so in the end of the day I want my drums to work for me not against me you can understand that right so that's the thing then next pattern obviously let's turn some stuff down one two three I've played this um, track last week as well, but now you can see how I progress to a different track. So let's say it's all cool, I've built up the track. Um, no, I'm gonna show you something else first. I've got paths playing here. So you can hear how the track is now migrating. Let's go in because I think there's something with my, um, with my drums off, so I'll go in here. There you go. I need to just make sure that if I'm hitting volumes on different machines that it doesn't affect my drums here. There's a few things I still need to sort out. I will get to what I don't like about the MIDI mapping in a second. But still, this is playing. I've got the chorus playing, the thing that you heard last week. So that's already mapped as well, with a little bit of resonance. And now listen what happens, I've got the delay. Again, you can go completely crazy, go here, next sequence, go out, bam. drums I still have to look into it I think the mapping is okay but you know what um, the Akai for some reason loses the mapping sometimes so I can be adding another mapping to the launch control and all of a sudden the beat repeats are gone you know what I mean well, that's just it annoys me so Akai if you're watching this by any chance I don't think you are but if you are um, fix it because this is, this is insecurity that I don't need when I'm performing out on stage right okay now what I will do is go to uh, the last track that I have. So I'll go out, drum roll again. Let's mute the kick indefinitely. Bam, two, three, four. And I don't want to hold this button, so I'm gonna stick it like this as well. See, there's a lot of stuff that I can do now. <clears throat> go for another pattern, the last one here. So now I've got my track all building nice and nice and neat. <clears throat> the beat repeats are affecting my drums only, they're not affecting my moves. So you get to do more stuff, so in the meantime there's a lot of stuff happening. Nice one. Go back to the break. So 
so on my break obviously I've got my um, uh, move back I needed to adjust a few things uh, and uh, did it off screen so this is the breakdown I will go in on five track five is where you as you can clearly hear this bad boy is coming uh, where this bad boy is coming from I'll go in and open my put a little bit of delay on there begin go to the next sequence Whoa. Let's save it quick fast. Save. Override it. Save it quick fast. I'm loving it. So now you hear how the meta and the um, subsequent are working together. Let's go back to a different pattern here. As you can hear, instant switching, different key, different thing. I will not go in as abruptly as I went in right now, but it is working. Take out my kick, play around with, play around with the claps. Again, two, three, and and you can hear that everything is moving gradually. We're not in a hurry. Playing around with the envelopes. Take out the pick. A little bit of ambience. Let's go to a different pattern. One, two, three, four. And you build up your music like that. Usually I would play a little bit more stuff, but obviously you know I've got my eyes on something coming soon. Something polyphonic, so I'm not saying what it is, but I would probably lay out some paths right here. Let's go to a different sequence. The arpeggio is a little bit on the loud side, but anyway, it's just a work in progress, as I said. The 
Yes. Turn down this arp a little bit. Find the arp, there you go. So obviously, there's a lot of stuff that you can do. You need to just find your specific settings on how you like to work it. I like to think of my music in, in, in brackets. So I need grooves like the one I've played you before. Let's start out this, um, say, like I said, this track is uh, build out next sequence page. I always go to the next sequence page. This track is built out of the four tracks. So obviously this is going to be my uh, groove. The snare drum play. And then obviously I'll just turn it down, but turn it off if I don't need it. I play around with it, so you can hear the delay of the octave track just uh, hanging around, obviously. And then with the different scenes, also with the different uh, MIDI uh, parts, which you have over here, because four of them, you can stick different effects on your um, scenes as well. Uh, on scene, I've got like, like almost, uh, I've got like uh, six mapped out right now, all different ones. But there, and when I go to the second sort of like part, I can stick a delay or um, distortion or whatever. So within the track, you can access different things as well. As well as uh, something that I'm really contemplating, I would like to put a little bit of reverb on this one as well. And instead of just going completely crazy and just uh, going the Strymon route, which is what everybody seems to be doing, I can now get a neighboring track to go next to the track that I already have. Uh, so I can use and reverb and the delay that I have right now. But for now, I think the reverb is... It's working. Nice one. Going back to those drums to wrap it up. I don't want to make this video too long. Um, going back to the drums, um, the first thing that you need to do, which is what I did, is I really went in deliberately listening to what is it that most people are doing? How are they working it? What is the, the, the fabric of the groove? And I have to say, I didn't want to come up with that stuff myself. I mean, I've made music for ages, but still, just having a ballpark or a, um, a direction or where you want your sound to go makes the mapping of what it is that you need easier because I can imagine you can get lost. You can map a gazillion things on the Akai MPC Live, but do you need them? Only map out stuff that you are going to end up using. So obviously the kick is something you would like to mute momentarily. Two, three, go in. So maybe, oh, you know, if something's happening or you lost track, say this is a um, 16 bar sequence. Nine, 10, 11 and it goes on and then obviously but if i'm doing something and i end up going against the beat or against the groove i can just oh one two three four five six seven eight and boom and then change something else which is nice and i can do it with one hand or just mute it and just wait and play around and everybody lost track of the beat and it's it's, it's just a way of working it just snap on you you like it. Like I saw Botson do, the envelope on the snare, open it up. You can do two things at once, which means the snare is now sitting better in the groove. If it's even shorter, you don't even hear it coming because now you'll hide it in the hi-hat. Listen to my hi hat my head. I've got a hat playing and I've got a uh, side stick 808 playing. Tick 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 stop. Tick 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 stop. It's nice to just like have that thing sit there, which is not the biggest sound in the world, but if I envelope my snare short enough, you really need to be very savvy to hear that that's gonna come up. I'll open it up slowly. 
It will fail, it will go wrong, sometimes you will forget about the kick, well that's the cool part of playing live, right? Now, what else would you need? Something on your claps? Your arpeggio? So, so that this doesn't play by itself, so if it's coming out of the darkness, say this is coming out of the depths, your snare is coming out of the depths, and you need a little bit more adrenaline or a little bit more musicality, You can make one sound and out of those sounds as well. So those sounds are not one sound. So I've got a Jupiter plane and I've got a subsequent plane. What's not to like here? So you can imagine that this is going to work. Listen to the drums, everything is sitting neatly. So I've also put my monitor speakers in front of my face and I deliberately placed sounds where I thought they would, would need it to go. Where they needed to go. They got my kick and the snare. There. Open up the subsequent a little more. One, two, three, four. And I've envelope generated also the sound, so that means that if I'm opening up the filter, the sound is gonna get longer. You can hear it's very percussive now. Because this is lingering on that Jupiter Arp is just playing. Listen to how short it is. Let's lower it. Map it here. Nice. So that if you're going to introduce a bad boy like the subsequent, it doesn't really just like come out and just hit people in the face too obviously. It's not going to be Ableton in a box. I don't think you should aim for that. I don't think that you should try to mimic it, but there are certain things that the Ableton Brigade does that you would want to do with your hardware as well. The cool thing is this sounds way better than Ableton because this is just analog kind of gear. Um, I know it might be controversial for me to say, but most guys with Ableton that I see show up with a sound card, it has that digital edge to it. There's a, some sort of low end that, that's lacking sometimes. Not everyone sounds like it. I'm definitely not naming any names and I do believe there's a lot of cool guys out there but then I've already kicked so much ass with this stuff being as thick and as big as it is that now that I can mimic a little bit what's going on with those uh, laptop jocks I can now be a little bit more flexible on what it is that I'm doing because otherwise the way I did it before in my other life set it was like everything was like band member this plays this and it's cool and I will still do it that way because there's different tasks for the equipment to play but you need to interlock certain things certain things need to go if this has a certain way then this needs to act a certain way as well so like I said I'll play that groove again just the groove turn this off so kick here on the fader kick momentarily muted kick indefinitely muted same with the snare momentarily snare bump both of them gone so have the drum roll stick kick off then obviously and when you hit it it'll just instantly start bum, 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 bum. back out and boom Listen to the snare. There's a snare that's playing against with the uh, um, uh, playing together with the claps. That's already mapped as well. So if I'm opening up the feedback on the delay, you can hear that the snare goes away. So obviously it leaves more room for my snare drum. So now you're getting stacked, stack, and you don't want it. Why did I do it that way? An 808 snare has got like a lot of high end frequency content as well, and the 909 snare as well. But if the, this is playing and you're opening up the release, you don't hear it as much here. 
people here, it means that you're, giving, you're making so much energy that it needs to be the payoff when your beat goes in. So you need to take out something out of the mid frequency in order for your drop to just hit again. I'd like to welcome Pyotr Politaev as my new patron, as well as Tom Jones. Thank you for joining. I think you just uh, hopped over from Tovarsi's uh, live chat that we done uh, last week. So thank you for uh, supporting my little uh, niche uh, corner of the web. And especially Dennis, the Phantom Menace. Welcome to the highest tier patronage. So uh, your support is absolutely, um, uh, yeah, respected. And, and, and I'm happy that you guys are supporting me. I'm doing a few things. I'm upping the ante, getting better equipment, getting better quality videos, maybe, you know, getting the questions a little bit better to you. I want to make some music with you guys as well. So the highest tier patrons, I will make music with you guys, which means let's get a conversation going. I mean, I've seen over the past months that uh, just being out there and being available doesn't really just like appeal to a lot of people. It does, but at the same time, everybody's busy, life gets in the way. So I thought, what better way to just like do what we like to do and talk about music, but also make music together. So the higher, highest tier patrons are actually uh, directly making music with myself. We're going to release it on my label. Um, obviously, it's going to be um, a while and a minute because, um, yeah, it, <laughs> everybody uh, is really coming up with some really cool stuff. So let me process that and let's work on the stuff that we can actually do. The second tiers down are going to do some remixes for it as well. So um, towards the end of this year, probably more during the, in the new year, we're going to set it up properly and, and have the release schedule in place. Now, um, you might have heard me say on, on the different videos that I'm trying to build a mixer. I was actually trying, I'm actually trying to build a mixer um, to accompany what I think is missing within the dollars realm. There are so many cool club mixers and there's so many cool studio mixers, but that's not a hybrid for a uh, dollars live performer. So stuff that holds a clock on, uh, in it, uh, stuff that has um, um, some crushing or, or a bit crushing or diode clipping on, on, on the channels, uh, mono inputs. There's a few things that I do think that are, are missing on mixers that we could benefit from. And I was trying to build that, but COVID is really, really throwing a lot of uh, crap into the equation because to get parts, it's just like near to impossible almost. It's just ridiculous. So we're <laughs> really struggling to get the parts or get the matched parts and that's still working. But at the minute, you know what I mean? I'm probably going to look at, um, um, yeah, getting the studio set up run in a way that I'm condensing my uh, studio setup down or at least uh, working it in a way that it's manageable and it's easier to just transport, but also it'll be modular in a sense, not modular as in modular, but modular as in not one case, maybe a few cases that are smaller, but can just like be locked together and uh, build a symphonic orchestra, a digital orchestra or an analog orchestra. I just said the word orchestra way too. Um, you know what I mean. So that's that. Um, yeah, uh, you can find the music on Bandcamp. You can also uh, enlist on this channel. That's another thing, channel memberships, which is a thing, a thing that YouTube is doing, which is absolutely amazing. It's cool. It means that you can be a member of this channel. Now, I've got different tiers on there, apart from Patreon. On Patreon, it's more of an interactive thing that I connected to Discord, where we can talk and chat. And after this video, we'll do um, uh, maybe some sort of a Q&A or maybe just like getting into certain things. Uh, talking about a topic, talking about everything. There's a lot of people, uh, it's a global thing, so it'll be cool to just talk to a lot of people, like-minded folks. And if you've got more questions than you have answers, that's never a good thing, so I always opt to say, go over to Patreon and list there. Channel, channel memberships is where you can actually film yourself asking me a question and make it a small sort of like question, not like, you know, small. And send it to me, I will edit it into the video and I will see if I can address those questions. So get in touch, uh, let me know what's going on. Also those uh, higher tier patrons over there or higher tier supporters can also uh, come into Discord. So build school, we're building a community. There's a lot of us already and we're all talking since and stuff. Now, if not anything else, I'll bid you health, prosperity and good knob tweaking. And I'll catch you next week on another video. Peace.